Welcome back. So we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Um, as you may recall, we almost finished John chapter 7 on our last visit, and uh, we had about two paragraphs to go, and then we go into John chapter 8. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you really, in order to get the full flavor of what's going on here, you really need to see John 7 and 8 as one chapter because it, they're all related to each other, all right? And, 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 and that's really important to keep that in mind, all right? So hopefully, you just finished watching the John chapter 7a, if you will, and now we're ready to go to John chapter 8, part 1, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So let's pick up right here. Uh, uh, draw your attention to John 7, starting in verse 37. Jesus took his stand and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Rivers of living water will brim and spill out of the depths of anyone who believes in me this way. Just as the scripture says, he said this in regard to the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were about to receive. The Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Those in the crowd who heard these words were saying, this has to be the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. But others are saying, the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Don't the scriptures tell us that the Messiah comes from David's line and from Bethlehem, David's village? So there was a split in the crowd over him. Some went so far as wanting to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. Now remember, Jesus is floating around through the crowd, not saying anything, incognito, listening to these conversations, listening to some people who are totally on his side, who are going, this has got to be the Messiah. Think about all the miracles he's done. Think about all the people that he's healed and all the things that we've seen. And others are going, well, wait a minute. This is, isn't he called Jesus of like Nazareth? How can Jesus of Nazareth also be from Bethlehem? Um, so they apparently they didn't go back and read the book of Luke. And so they don't understand that even though his father lived in Nazareth, he was actually born in Bethlehem. So that wasn't clear to them. So there is this division. And Jesus is listening to this. Now, this is the Weist version, the, just the first, uh, the first verse of that thing, thing, thing we just read, and we just read from the, um, from the Peterson translation. So here is Weist, and it says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus was standing, and he shouted in a loud voice, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him be coming to me, and let him be drinking. He who believes on me, just as the scripture said, rivers out of his inmost being shall flow of living water. Now this is significant. It is significant because of when he said it. All right, they are celebrating what? Remember what feast this was? We just talked about it in John chapter seven. What feast is everybody celebrating in Jerusalem right now? The Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, what are they celebrating in the Feast of Tabernacles? This is a celebration of how God provided for the Jewish nation while they were wandering about in the desert for 40 years. What happens when you're wandering in the desert? You, you die, okay? Basically, you wander in the desert long enough and you die because there's no, like, food and no water. But God miraculously provided for them. He made it water. He made water come out of a rock for 40 years. So they always had water, uh, fresh water. And in addition, he provided food. Manna came out of the sky, and birds dropped down, and they had birds to eat and manna to eat. And he met their needs for 40 years. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is a celebration of what God did for the nation of Israel during those 40 years be between coming out of Egypt and going to the Promised Land in Canaan. All right, and just in case you forgot, how do you know it's the Feast of Tabernacles? Go back to John 7, and at the very first, first part, it says later Jesus was going about his visit to Galilee. He didn't want to travel in Judea because the Jews there were looking for a chance to kill him. It was near the time of tabernacles, a feast annually observed by the Jews. Okay, now when is the Feast of Tabernacles? Because they still celebrate it to this day. Typically, it's in October. And so what John is doing is John is telling you when this takes place. Now, what year is it? Well, if you, if you say, if you imagine that Jesus died in the year 33 AD, ostensibly, I mean, and it's arguable, but let's say that most people go along with 33 AD. Let's say that's the date. Okay, if 33 AD is when Jesus was crucified, then what we're talking about is that would be April 
of 33 AD. So the setting of John chapter 7 here is October 32 AD. This is like six months before the crucifixion. So this is the fall preceding the winter and spring, and that spring is when Jesus is going to be crucified. Okay? So John is telling you this is when these next events that I'm about to describe to you, so this is the, the date. It's telling you it's the last day. Well, it's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, and he's going to identify the specific day of the year in which Jesus is going to say these next things that he's about to say. Okay. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. <laughs> and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sing no more. When you first read that, you get the idea that, what a coincidence! Oh my gosh, Jesus just happens to be in town, and at the same time, there is a raid on her boyfriend's house, and they get caught in the act. And spirit, they just happen to catch her right there and drag her out in front of Jesus, who has this crowd of people who are listening to him and trusting him and believing in him. And the Pharisees have to come and interrupt this intimate meeting to get his advice on what to do with this woman who just happened to be caught right then in the act of adultery. What are the chances? Okay. Most scholars don't believe that she was caught in the act. She was probably caught red-handed, but not exactly at that time. She'd probably been caught weeks earlier, and they kind of just kind of left that hang over her head, and they, choose, they chose to drag her out because they were kind of planning on this. Jesus had been there several months before. They hated him. They wanted him dead. They wanted to discredit him. And probably they had this set up the whole time. I mean, it's a beautiful plan if you think about it, all right? The deal was they didn't want to openly arrest him in front of all the people as long as he had the favor of the crowds. I mean, people liked him. He was healing their sick, for crying out loud. He was speaking up the scriptures with authority like he knew what he was talking about. Uh, in some cases, he raised the dead. Blind people could see, deaf people could hear, lame people were walking. The crowd was with him a lot. And so they had to discredit him. And so by bringing this dilemma, it was a win-win situation for them, okay? They remind him that in the law of Moses, a woman caught in adultery could be stoned to death. But if Jesus supported the law of Moses and had her stoned, and the Romans said, hey, wait a minute, you can't stone people to death. That's a capital offense. Only Romans can do that. Who authorized the stoning? Oh, it was that crazy, uh, that, that crazy rabbi, Jesus. He's the one. And so they get Jesus in trouble with the Romans. But if he says, oh, no, I'm a, God, I'm, I'm a, I'm a man of love. I, 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 I support love and, and, and forgiveness. If he did that, then the people would, then the, then the Pharisees could say, I thought you were the Messiah. 
I thought you were the one that the God of Abraham sent, the Messiah, and if you were the Messiah, then you would support the law of Moses. And so, since you neglect the law of Moses by forgiving this sinful woman, obviously, you can't be Israel's Messiah. So, whichever way it goes, they, they feel they got it made. All right? So, that's the test before Jesus. So, what does Jesus do? Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the dirt. They kept at him, badgering him. He straightened up and said, The sinless one among you, go first, throw the stone. Bending down again, he wrote some more in the dirt. Hearing that, they walked away, one after another, beginning with the oldest. The woman was left alone. Jesus stood up and spoke to her. Woman, where are they? Does no one condemn you? No, master. Neither do I, said Jesus. Go on your way. From now on, don't sin. Before I go on, it's important to understand that uh, there was a technique by which Jewish rabbis taught very often with their students. And what they would do was they would, uh, they expected the students to know their scriptures. And so to remind them of a particular scripture, they would often reference the scripture right before the target one, right before the one they wanted them to recall. All right? Jesus used that very technique. For example, over there in Matthew 21, 15, uh, when the children shouted Hosanna to him in the temple, and the chief priest and the, 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 the chief priest and the teachers of the law became very angry about that. And they were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the, 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 the religious leaders were like, whoa, shut them up. You got to stop them. And they said to Jesus, you need to shut these people up. I mean, that is like blasphemy, man. And Jesus responded by quoting Psalm 8:2, From the lips of children and infant, you have ordained praise. Now, what's so wrong with that? They became really angry after that. They became furious with him. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. Why would they get so angry? Because the verse that follows that, and as, as, as Pharisees, they would recognize that because that's how, it was, that's how you taught. You, you would say the verse before to, to make the person think of the verse that follows. The verse that follows that is that the enemies of God will be silenced. Okay? Children and infants offer praise because the enemies of God will be silenced. And so by quoting that, what they were doing when, they, when, they, when their minds went to that next verse, what Jesus was saying is that you want them to be silent? You are enemies of God. That's why they became indignant. And so that's Ramez. That's an example of Ramez. Quoting the verse before so you can sting people with the verse that comes after. Now one thing that everybody has probably wondered at one time because some of you who are watching this have been through the book of John before. I know I've been through there. I can't count how many times I've uh, read through the book of John. And every time I've been through it, I have wondered this question. What was Jesus writing in the sand? What was up with that? Was he doodling? Was he like making a Mickey Mouse or what? What was he drawing in the sand? Nobody has any answers. I mean, it doesn't say, none of the Gospels discuss what he wrote. It's not in the epistles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul. Nobody, nobody comments on what he actually wrote. Clearly, none of his disciples had a vantage point where they could see what he was writing in the sand. Now, over the years, I have heard, and then, you, know, you read the rest of the story, and, um, you know, where, where uh, when Jesus straightens up and says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, and then they, they're really convicted, and they throw down their stones from the oldest to the youngest. Now, there are several possibilities here. One is that that's all that happened. Jesus literally was doodling in the sand. He was literally just doodle. It didn't mean anything. And when he said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, well, they were like, whoa, that's deep, man. Yeah, I, don't, I got sin, so I can't throw this stone. Better throw it down. It could have been as simple as that. Okay, it really could have been. That's one possibility, because we don't have the actual absolute answer. Another possibility that I've, I've heard in the past that, that I think has merit is where Jesus, being God, was aware of all the sins of all the people that brought this woman before him, and he would write their name in the sand next to a particular sin that they had committed. 
Okay? And so by doing that, he's revealing a couple things. Number one, even though I'm not from Jerusalem, I know all y'all by name. And not only do I know your name, this is what you did. Didn't think I knew about that, did ya? And so seeing that, they're like, whoa, oh man. You know, that kind of suggests that maybe you are who you claim to be. And if I stone this woman, I don't want to be guilty of those sins and murder. And so, not going to throw the stone, not taking a chance that you might be who you claim to be. That's a possibility. Now, recently, I heard a new one. And this one, I thought, wow, that's like the best one so far. And let me share it with you. What if he wrote down a passage, Jeremiah 17, 13. And then, after Jeremiah 17, 13, he writes their names in the dust after Jeremiah 17, 13. So I'm sure you're probably asking, uh, what does Jeremiah 17, 13 say? Very good question. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Now think about that. Jesus has just that very day announced himself as the source of living water. Has he not? And they have rejected him. And so now he's saying that all who forsake you will be put to shame because they have forsaken you. And I will write their name in the dust. And so then he writes the reference and then he writes their names in the dust. I got that. I would love to say that I made that up, that I came up with that idea. I did not. I don't know who originally did it. I think it might have been Joe Amarell. I'm not sure if he made it up or if he got it from somebody else, but it was really good. So I'm just going to play a clip from Joe Amarell discussing this because he did a great job. And that's where I got it from. And I just thought it was really cool. The Feast of Tabernacles has what's called a last and great day. And on that day, what would happen is uh, the priest would leave the temple area and he would walk down to the Pool of Siloam. And earlier in the week, we talked about living water mm -hmm. being, being important in the Jewish culture because it came from rain, from springs, or from rivers. So the Pool of Siloam was spring-fed, so it was filled with living water. So every year on, on this last day of this great Feast of Tabernacles, the priests would leave the temple area, and they would march down to the Pool of Siloam, and they would take a, a jug or a pitcher of some kind, and they would dip it into this pool and fill it with living water, and then they would march it back up to the temple. And during the ceremony, the, the priest would take this, and he would, I want people to imagine, just him pouring out water, splashing on this cold stone altar, at the height of the dry time in Israel. Mm -hmm. The priest is just throwing water away, and people are saying, what are you doing? We could have used that you know, for, for our animals or for something. But while the priest is doing that, as he's pouring this living water on the altar, the Bible says that a young rabbi from Galilee came in through the back. And as the priest was asking God to send his living water, Jesus comes in and he says, I'm the living water. And he says, drink, of, I see your eyes. Yeah. He says, drink of me and you'll never thirst, thirst again. again. And then, unfortunately, the people didn't accept him as the living water, did they? Mm -hmm. They reject him. They kick him out of the temple area. And when he gets out there, he meets this woman who's caught in the act of adultery. And they want to know what Jesus is going to do. Is he going to call for her death? Is he going to call for her to be ex excommunicated? What's he going to do? And instead of responding, now remember, this woman's life is in his hands. Whatever he says, they're going to do. If he says, let her go, she's gone. If, they, if he says, put her to death, they're going to put her to death. But instead of reacting, instead of responding, he does something unusual. He stoops. And he starts to doodle in the sand. It'd be the equivalent today if somebody said, hey, Joe, should we let this guy go or not? If I was to take my phone and start to check my Twitter feed instead of answering your question. I mean, Jesus is just kind of doodling. And I said, what are you doing? If you don't know what the feasts are and you don't understand Remez, the hinting method, you're going to miss this. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, it's Jeremiah. I have it here, 1713. Now, I'm going to read it because this is very, very powerful. All right. It says, O Lord, the hope of Israel... All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken, they have rejected the Lord, the spring, the source of living water. 
you can say wow there. Wow. That's an amen. That's an amen and a wow. Right. So as he was writing in the sand, <laughs> you talk about Ramez, he was calling them back to a time where God would send his living water to the temple, men would reject him, and uh, God would write their names in the dust of the earth. And God is doing that right there, God in human form. Absolutely. Human flesh. Now you can understand why they put down their stones and they ran away. Okay, enough said. So I thought that was very beautiful. And I'm not sure if it's one, two, or three. What was, was he doodling? And they dropped the stones out of guilt because they had sin and they recognized it. Did he write their names and their particular secret sin? Or did he quote Jeremiah there and talk where God talks about writing their name in the dust and then literally write their name in the dust? Any one of those could be or maybe something else that we don't know about. But in any case, it was obviously effective. 8, starting in verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. What does he mean by that? And you have the word of my Father who sent me. How do they have God's word, his Father's word on it? What, what is he talking about? When Jesus did a miracle, whether it's walking on water or healing a blind person, he attributed that miraculous activity to the Father. And, and so one of the things when he says, you have two witnesses, it's not just what I'm telling you. Look at what I'm doing. Did anybody else cause the blind to see or heal lame people? Did anybody else do miracles like this? Has there ever been anybody, have you ever seen anybody in history do what I'm doing outside of God? Well, put two and two together. That's the father being the other witness that I'm telling you the truth. And he expected people to put two and two together. That was his second witness. If you see, he actually came out and said, if you don't believe the words I'm saying, believe because of the works I'm doing. He said that on several occasions, okay? So he expected people to pay attention. He didn't do the miracles to be showy for the sake of being showy. He did it so that people would understand that it confirms the claims that he was making about himself. He goes on, and that's, what, and that's what you have. You have my word and you have the word of the Father who sent me. They said, where is this so-called father of yours? Jesus said, you're looking right at me and you don't see me. How do you expect to see the father? If you knew me, you would at the same time know the father. He gave this speech while teaching in the temple. No one arrested him because his time wasn't yet up. All right. Now, I really want you to think about this because that last sentence that I just said is of, it's, it's a great significance and I never really appreciated the, the significance of that sentence until relatively recently. And here's what I mean. Okay, before I became a Christian, I was involved in um, something called telecult power. It's a form of the occult, occult practice, essentially white witchcraft, okay? And how did I get sucked into something like that? I was very young, for one thing, and uh, I was impressed by the stories that they entice you to get, in, to get involved with this. You want to you wanna, you wanna get control and have a better life? Learn how to cast spells. And they would give examples of Charlotte W. in northern England uh, cast a spell for love, and the man and she wanted fell in love with her three days later and gave her everything she wanted okay these are the kinds of anecdotal stories that were told now one thing about those stories is that they were vague enough to where you couldn't check on them all right it didn't tell you exactly what the maybe what the full name was or if, it, if they did it would be like a very common name you know Tom Jones of Anaheim California great so good luck and that was before the internet okay so good luck finding 
you know, which Tom Jones in Anaheim, California. And also, they would never tell you when it happened or exactly where it happened. And so, it's a good, it's a good trick. If you want to tell a really big whopping lie, make sure that you add, it happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. All right? And when you make it that vague and out of touch, nobody can check on you. And if they can't check on you, then you can tell any lie you want because it's undeniable, not verifiable, and not deniable. Okay? There you go. And so if people want to believe it, well, they can go ahead and believe. Okay? You can't, nobody's going nobody's gonna to shoot you down. Now, I want you to pay attention to something here. John is writing this book. Now, if, a lot of people have accused the Bible of being full of legends. Okay, these are stories that never really happened. They're legends that built up over centuries. Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh my goodness, no. Jesus was a, was a rabbi and he had some nice sayings and so forth, but what happened was that after he died and several hundred years passed, legends built up about him and the Catholic Church added a bunch of crap and they turned him into this heavenly figure to where he's equal with God. That was a legend and the original Jesus was nothing like that. Okay? Here are the problems with that particular problem. These theories evolved when a time when the earliest manuscripts that we have, the earliest copies of the New Testament, were like 400 years after the events. Right? Well, that was a long time ago. Now, especially after the Dead Sea Scrolls and archaeology has progressed, we have manuscripts of the New Testament that date to about 120, 130 AD. That is within the lifetimes of secondhand witnesses. I mean, John himself had, had, had students, Papias, Polycarp, Justin Martyr. These, the copies that we have today date to within their lifetimes. It dates within 20 years, like of the death of John, okay? Now, there was no time for a legend to build up. It's, it's nonsense. It's too close to the, to the events themselves. So copies existed, and we have examples of those copies that date back into the lifetimes of secondhand and secondhand witnesses. Okay, that's a problem for the, for the idea that this could be legend. Now, if John, what that tells us is that what we have today is what the Apostle John actually wrote. Okay, there, there really wasn't time for legend to build up. Now, if John had been vague and Jesus never really made these claims that he was the, the, the source of living water, that he was equal to God, which we're going to get into in a minute here, then John should have left it vague and said, you know, Jesus was in Israel and said this to some Israeli people, but not said who he said it to or when it occurred or where he said it. Because the minute you start l nailing it down, then later on people can go back and say, hey, if he did this in public, are there people from that time period that might validate or refute this? Okay. John gives us specifics. Now, as you know, from the first part of John, we know what time of year it was. It was in the, the time of the, during the time of Feast of Tabernacles. But not only do you know that it was in October of 32 AD, we know the day that this situation. How do we know the day? Because it said earlier that it was on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So that gives you a specific calendar day that this took place. Now, on that last sentence here, down there in verse uh, 20, it says here, he gave this speech in the treasury while teaching in the temple. So not only do we know that this particular presentation takes place before the religious leaders and the people of Israel, it took place in the temple on this day, not only in the temple, but in the treasury of the temple. So John is telling us the day the building and the room in which where Jesus is saying all of these things that are now being quoted in John chapter 7 and John chapter 8. So keep that in mind. If this was a, a fairy tale such as what we see in a lot of these anecdotal stories of the supernatural where they never tell you exactly who was involved, when it occurred, and there are no records, this we're, we have the specifics. Okay? So, so this is essentially something that happened in history. 
not legend. The one, this is the Peterson version. Then he went over the same ground again. I'm leaving you and you're gonna look for me, but you're missing God in this and are headed for a dead end. There's no way you can come with me. The Jews said, so is he gonna kill himself? Is that what he means by you can't come with me? Jesus said, you're tied down to the mundane. I'm in touch with what is beyond your horizons. You live in terms of what you can see and touch. I'm living on other terms. I told you that you were missing God in all this. You're at a dead end. If you won't believe that I am who I say I am, you're at a dead end of, your, of sins. You're missing God in your lives. Now that's the Peterson version and he says it very nicely. Now as I mentioned, the Wies version is more trustworthy. It's more difficult to understand because he uses a lot more words, but he, when it comes to using the, the specifics of the English language to describe what, what the author is trying to say in Greek, you can't be, beat the Wies translation. So I'm going to read that same passage in the Wies translation. Therefore, again, he said to them, I will withdraw and you will seek me, and in your sin you shall die. Where I am departing, as for you, you're not able to come. Then the Jews were saying, surely he will not by any chance kill himself, will he? Because he's saying, where I am departing, you are not able to come. And he was saying to them, as for you, from beneath you are. As for myself, from above I am. As for you, of this world you are. As for myself, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you, you shall die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. Now this is, this is more specific than what we read in the Peterson translation. The Peter translation, in my opinion, on this particular passage was kind of wishy-washy. The Wiest is much more specific because what he's saying has a gravity that is a little bit more sobering. Okay, what does he mean when he says, unless you believe that I am, you shall die in your sin? To understand the significance of that, you need to understand the, the meaning of the words I am. Okay, in Greek, I am is egoemi, all right? That is not something that you were supposed to say in the first century uh, uh, Hebrew world, okay? Why is that? The Septuagint was the Greek version of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible. And in that book, when Moses is on the mountain and you got God speaking through the burning bush and God is telling Moses to go back to Egypt and tell the, the, the children of Israel to, to, to get ready to leave and talk about the plagues and tell them that God is calling you to the promised land. Moses asked, okay, uh, which God should I say is talking? You know, which God is calling them out of Egypt? What is your name? And remember what God's response was? Tell them that I am sent you. Ego eimi. That's what the Greek, now in Hebrew, it's four consonants and no vowels. Y-H-W-H. You can't pronounce it. And so what the people do, because it's unpronounceable, is they add vowels. And so Y-H-W-H in the German pronunciation, Y is pronounced J, and so that's where you get the word Jehovah. Okay, he didn't say Jehovah, but we add vowels because it's hard to say words with no vowels. And so that's where Jehovah comes from. Or the Y, you can pronounce it as Y, and you add vowels, and that's how you end up with Yahweh. Okay, now in Greek, the, it, basically it's translated as the closest thing they could come up with is tell them I am sent you, and so ego me, I am. And so people were careful not to call themselves the I am because the Jews recognized that I am is equivalent to saying that you are God. And so read that way, it says, you remember, think about this. Jesus said, therefore I said to you, you shall die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. You shall die in your sins. He repeats it again. So for people who acknowledge that Jesus is a great person, even a prophet, even an angel, it's not the same. And, you know, and, I, and I'm, I don't know for sure what's going to happen when you get to heaven exactly. If everything else is right and you just get this wrong, um, I, I, I would be concerned about this particular verse. Okay, I'm just saying, this is what he said. Unless you believe that I am, unless you believe, ego me, you're going to die in your sins. Okay? So it's kind of like the way I, I, the way I picture it is this. All right. We had, all of us, have a lot of sin, okay? None of us are good enough 
to get into heaven on our own. Not one of us. We've all got a bunch of crud, okay? And a lot, you know, today a lot of people think as long as they're not racist or sexist or homophobic or, 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 or narrow-minded, then they're fine. They can do anything they want, and it's not bad. Well, that's not exactly how it works, okay? Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot more to morality than those particular popular sins, okay? We all have them, and none of us are good enough. And God recognized that. We, he says that our good works are as filthy rags. In other words, we're kind of disgusting. However, he loved us so much that he, that he said, you know, there's no way they can be good enough to get into heaven, but I love them anyway. And so what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to go down there, live the perfect sinless life, and then I am going to bear all of their sins on myself, and I'm going to punish all those sins on me. I am going to bear the punishment for all of their sins. So when I die on that cross, I'm going to take all of their punishment with me. And so my righteousness is going to be put into their account and their sins are going to be put in my account and I'm going to nail them to that cross and when I die on that cross all their sins die too and so whenever I feel a rage about whatever dishonesty or crappy sin they did that rage will bounce right off of them onto me on that cross so that never again will I vent my anger at them. Okay. Now, what is necessary to experience that? Just that the subject acknowledge that they had these sins, acknowledge that they're not good enough, and receive the gift and say, thank you, God. Thank you for dying on, in my place. Thank you for coming down, not making a peon, not making an angel, not making a robot, not making a clone and coming down here, but you yourself coming here and dying in my place, okay? That's kind of how it works. Who are you? Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things, and he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Now, that, I have to say, this last paragraph has me a little bit puzzled. And I wish I had a better answer for you. I don't really understand why that last paragraph won people over. I mean, up to now, I thought he was speaking pretty clearly. And they didn't get it. And then he comes out with that last chapter and talks about when you raise up the Son of Man, then you'll know who I am. And I'm thinking, okay, does, do they know that he's going to be crucified when they said raise him up? Is that what they know? Why? What is it about that last sentence that finally made him go, oh, I get it now. I'm on your side. You must be the guy. All right. Now, we're going to stop here, but I want to, I, and before you get all excited and think, well, this is great, Jesus won the crowd over, and everybody lived happily ever after, I'm going to tell you right now that when we move ahead, these very people who are on his side, when he goes further and tries to get them to have even more faith, they turn on him, okay? So I want you to understand that, you know, yes, they're on his side now, but in a minute, uh, they're not going to be his friends, okay? So we're going to stop right here. Um, hopefully, I hope you got something out of this. I uh, hope that you understand a little bit more about what happened when the woman caught in adultery came in and you guys, everybody threw down their rocks and everything. You got a better idea about what was going on there. But also, the other big takeaway picture, the big takeaway point that I hope that you get is that John is telling us about history. He's bringing up facts from his memory and he is providing a setting that could be checked. Okay, this stuff, this book, we know that the book of John was circulating probably within his lifetime and certainly in the next 20 years after his death, it was all over the place. There were multiple copies all over the Roman Grecian world, okay? And now, the thing is, is that this is like lying about the events of McCarthy era or John F. Kennedy 
okay, or, or World War II, there are people who are still alive who remember that stuff. There are people whose parents were alive when these things took place. It's you, when you start going through and describing events with the things that Jesus said in public and you say where it happened, who the witnesses were, and when they occurred, you open yourself up to scrutiny. You open yourself up so that your enemies can check on it and say, liar, liar. This Christianity stuff is lies because guess what? We know people from back then. We know Jews who lived in Jerusalem who were there at the Feast of Tabernacles on the last day. And if Jesus spoke in public, he didn't say anything like that, okay? If, G if John had made this stuff up, then why would he open himself up to scrutiny like this? I want you to think about that, okay? Thanks for listening. See you next time.